Okay, today is the last lecture, so I'm going to tell you about open problems. Um, yeah, actually, the last two lectures were about additive combinatorics, and we saw some nice open problems there, uh, especially like the polynomial Freiman Ruge conjecture and its related conjectures about some sets. This one I like that says if A is a subset of 1% of the cube, then A plus A contains all of a subspace of codimension root n. Those are all good ones, but I just told you about them like last week, so I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, so I feel bad about skipping that subfield's open problem. So my first open problem will also be from additive combinatorics, and it's a very famous one. It's called uh, the triangle removal problem. And you can think of it as uh, some kind of testing, property testing problem. Uh, I guess this was in the context of Boolean functions proposed by Green in 2005. And uh, suppose you have a sense of following. Suppose you have some subset of F2 to the n. And you do the following experiment. You pick x and y uniformly at random, and you look at whether x, y, and x plus y are all in A. Okay, uh, a triple x, y, and x plus y in this context is called a triangle for some reason. And suppose you do that and you find that this probability is very small. Okay, this is something you could estimate with a small number of queries in the property testing setting. Okay, so the natural hope, much like the you know, linearity testing, is that this means A must be close to a triangle free set. Okay, close to a set that contains zero triangles. Uh, okay, so you may ask, is it true that A is delta, sorry, let's say uh, delta to the omega of 1 close to an A prime, which is triangle free? Okay, which means there's no uh, x y and x plus y all in A prime. Okay, when I say that it's this much close, I mean uh, you have to change A on that much fraction of elements of two to the, uh, f2 to the n to get to A prime. And actually, since your goal is to make A prime triangle free, when you're changing elements of A, you should just delete them. There's no point in ever adding anything. So you ask, you know, can you delete you know, polynomial in delta times two to the n elements from A to make it uh, completely triangle free? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All three of them. Yeah, in F two to the end, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you should think of, I mean, you should probably think of this delta as being like a constant, but like a small, a small one. You could just remove all of A oh, okay. if A is small. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's a question. I guess probably most people think the answer is no. Uh, so what's known on this problem, this is due to green from 05. Uh, it is true if instead of like polynomially close, uh, if you have like log star 1 over delta, actually you still need a polynomial factor close. Okay, so this is uh, uh, very much bigger, but it still has a nice property that it only depends on delta and it goes to zero with delta. And it uses some kind of regularity lemma, which is why you get this log star or tower type behavior. And on the other hand, the best uh, result in the other direction due to uh, Bhattacharya and Shit from 2010 is that, um, let's see, you can't beat uh, delta to the point 0.3 close. Okay, I guess I should put 
well, I can just put delta to the point 3. Okay, so they construct a set A which has this property, but it's not especially close to a truly triangle-free set. I mean, you have to delete this fraction of elements. Okay, so this is a great problem because it's a very simple statement and there's like a ridiculously enormous gap between the upper and lower bounds. I mean, it's much worse than what we had even before Sanders' theorem in uh, polynomial Freiman Ruge. So, yeah, a great problem. And I don't know what people guess, but I think most people guess that there's no polynomial bounds. In the context of triangle removal in graphs, there are lower bounds that are of this kind of shape, but uh, we don't know it in F2 to the N. Okay, any more questions about that one? All right. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to like list a bunch of problems for the whole hour uh, that I like very much. Okay, this is one that, uh, this next one is one that I really, really like a lot. It's perhaps my favorite. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. It's not just effect to it, right? They're not saying I'm, I'm going to remove that fraction of it. Uh, yeah, it's an absolute. Although you keep asking me these questions, it's making me nervous that like maybe I stated it wrong. No, no, uh, but I think this is correct. Okay. So then, it, yeah, then it makes sense. Okay. Because then the, that value that I had is fine. Okay. If it's with to the end. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Okay. Aronson and Binus. So this is. Uh, I know John like also obsesses about this conjecture. It's a good one. So Aronson, I guess, made this conjecture around 08. He was like telling it to people, and then it sort of appeared in a paper with M. Binus in 2011, and it's related to some stuff in quantum that was been asked about for quite some time. Uh, so this is a problem with applications, and uh, its motivation was quantum computing, but it's just like a pure Boolean Fourier analysis problem. So here it is. Uh, let f be a function on the Boolean cube, uh, which is bounded in the m interval minus 1, 1. Okay, so it's not Boolean valued, but it maps into the range. And let's assume that it has degree at most k. And if you think about it, it's kind of hard for a function of like really low degree, like degree 1 or 2 or 3, to be bounded between minus 1 and 1, unless one of two things happens, like you could just take any old function at all of degree k and multiply it by some extraordinarily tiny number. Okay, so it would be practically the zero function. That's one way. So we're going to get around that by imagining it has, let's say, large variance. And the other way is it could be like a junta, or it could depend on like just a couple of variables, and then this is no problem. But somehow it doesn't seem possible for f to like depend on like a lot of variables and have constant variance, yet still be bounded. Okay, and the conjecture says that uh, something along those lines. It says it's a weaker conclusion than it's like a junta, but it just says there's some variable with large influence. So there's some coordinate i such that the influence of coordinate i on f is at least, uh, let's put in the variance of f over k, and I'll put the O of 1 here. Okay, so just think of variance of f in your head as like 0.01 at least. So that's a constant, it just says that there's got to be an influence Who's uh, a, a coordinate whose influence is at least 1 over poly k. Um, okay, and if this is true, it has some actually strong negative consequences for the power of quantum computing. Let's show limitations on it. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, great problem. I'll tell you a little bit about what's known. Uh, this is known to be true. I'll put a check mark if f is like a Boolean valued function. You know, like it's a, it's a good old Boolean function. And uh, that follows from a, a paper of mine with Sachs, Schramm, and Servideo. Um, and some kind of weaker statement is known. Uh, it's also known if you just want exponentially bad dependence on k rather than polynomial. So if I put var over 2 to the k, then it's known. And that follows from a paper with uh, Dinner, Fried, Gut, and Kindler from 06 or 07.
Yeah, so I don't have much more to say to that. I mean, you can say the problem in like two lines, and it kind of seems intuitively true, but I don't know. So even this, this, even this fact is pretty non-trivial. It uses a lot of stuff, which is to say that like, even if you fix the degree to be 2, it's somewhat hard to prove this. I mean, it's not so easy to prove this statement. I guess degree 1 is easy. OK, so if you're interested in that one, Mahdi will also talk to you. You know, he also thinks about that problem a lot. Also, feel free to you know, stop me or ask any questions about these. OK. Uh, here's another great problem that I like. It's uh, also like very much like a pure Fourier analysis problem. It's called Fourier entropy influence conjecture. Okay, let's do the free gut and Kali from uh, 96. And they made the conjecture when they were thinking about um, threshold properties and random graphs, but uh, their applications for it, uh, I think they proved in other ways, but it still has some other applications. So this one's great. You can write it in almost no symbols. Uh, so it says that for all Boolean functions, and here it's you know, real Boolean valued functions, uh, this thing called the spectral entropy of F which I'll write like that, I'll define it in a second, is at most a constant times the total influence of F. Okay, the total influence of F is uh, something we know. This is uh, some universal constant. And this thing means, you know, if F is a Boolean function, we know the sum of the squares, the Fourier coefficients adds up to one, and these are non-negative numbers, so you could think of it as like a probability distribution on the subsets. And this is just its entropy. Okay, so it's sum over S, f hat s squared times log 1 over f hat s squared. Okay, yeah, actually I'm not 100% sure how they came up with this conjecture, but it's pretty awesome. Um, it's very similar to this conjecture, that, uh, this, this statement, theorem that we didn't talk about called uh, log Sobolev inequality. As you may know, it's uh, related to the hypercontractive inequality, and it looks kind of like this, but has all the same letters, just slightly rearranged. Uh, so maybe that's why they felt that it was true. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what's known for, about this guy. Uh, so it's known for some functions, some kinds of functions. Uh, it's known for, let's say, almost all poly size DNF. Okay, so a randomly chosen poly size DNF appropriately defined, satisfies this inequality. This is actually the first result uh, about this inequality. It was due to, let me just get the initials right, uh, Clivens, Lee, and Juan from 10. So you see it took like 14 years for like anything to be proven about this statement. Uh, it's also known to be true for symmetric functions and functions computed by read once decision trees what that's worth. That was uh, me with John Wright and Yuan Zhou. And, you know, Li Yong Tan and I, like, extended this somewhat to get, like, read once formulas. These are all, I don't know, I hope Li Yong doesn't mind. These are all kind of pathetic classes uh, over any set of gates. Um, but it's the best we can do. Uh, it's kind of hard to find, you know, these actually cover a lot of functions that you could dream up. You know, this covers like majority and this covers tribes. I don't know, it covers also kind of recursive majority of three and other stuff. So you can't really think of a function that doesn't satisfy it, but it's far from all functions. We also showed in this paper with 10 that like C has to be at least like 6.2 or something for what that's worth. Um, Yeah, so uh, I can add a little motivation for this problem or uh, explanation of what it's good for. Um, so 
So it's known, it's easy to see that it implies uh, this thing, Mansour's conjecture, which we talked about actually a while ago when we were talking about learning. In fact, I'll mention Mansour's conjecture again in a second. So if Mansour's conjecture is true, which is an implication, then you can learn uh, DNF sufficiently in some model. Uh, and it also implies something that I like to call the mean entropy influence conjecture. You may even be able to guess what it is. It's just what you get if you replace this with min entropy instead of the standard entropy. And uh, if you do that and rearrange a tiny bit, it's, uh, it's a very easy statement. It just says for any Boolean function, there exists some Fourier coefficient s such that f hat s squared is at least uh, 2 to the minus c times the total influence. So whatever the total influence is, there's at least one Fourier coefficient that's at least exponentially big in that. So this looks like an even simpler statement to me, and I don't know how to prove it. It doesn't look too complicated. Uh, I will say, though, that if you could prove this statement, which is weaker, that implies the KKL theorem. So it kind of tells you, you can't really expect a proof of this theorem that's too easy because, I don't know, the KKL theorem is pretty hard to prove. Um, and actually, furthermore, the KKL theorem uh, implies this theorem, this conjecture, for monotone functions. Okay, so if f is monotone, then you can prove this. It's like a very, very easy corollary of KKL. So all that's left is to like, prove it for non-monotone functions, and somehow it seems like even more true for non-monotone functions, but uh, oh, we don't know how to do it. So min entropy is just the minimum of the log step? Yeah, it's uh, exactly. Min entropy is like the, the log of the minimum. Uh, yeah, this is like the average value of log of 1 over s, and it's the min. Okay, yeah. Depends if you put, yeah. If you do the one over or not. Uh, all right. In the uh, Aronson or Bionic conjecture, uh -huh. do you know that the exponent has to be at least something? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to think about it. Um, for example, when they stated it, they actually stated like an L1 version of it rather than an L2 version, meaning like instead of looking at the expected value of f of x minus f of its neighbor squared, which is how we would define influence, they just took the absolute value. It's actually equivalent up to some powers, but because of that, I'm not 100% sure on what's known about what constant is necessary. I should think about it. Uh, that I'm not 100% sure of, but my guess is probably. So uh, a number of people have thought, so this, func this conjecture definitely very, somehow very, very heavily relies on the range being the set minus 1, 1. So for example, it's definitely false if it's, let's say, the interval minus 1, 1. It's also definitely false if, like, it maps into, let's say, the roots of unity over C. Uh, so these are both false. But so about, like, uh, if it maps into like, uh, I think so, and my guess is yes, but I don't know for sure. Um, usually for these things, it's easy to cook up a counterexample when it's false. So we could try to determine it after class. Uh, okay, Mansour's conjecture. I already talked about it, but. Uh, I'll just state it again very quickly because it's nice. Um, actually, I like the version uh, that was made back in 94 by Mansour. I like the version for width, which somehow managed to not actually get conjectured until like this year. I, uh, uh, Gopalan, Mecca, and Rheingold. Uh, so I'll give you this version. Uh, I'm pretty sure I stated it, but. Is that if f 
is a width w dnf, then its spectrum is you know, 0.01 concentrated on, at most, exponential and w coefficients. Okay, so all but 1% of its Fourier mass is on exponential and w coefficients. And uh, Mansour in 95 proved that you could get w to the w here. But somehow, like, the most interesting parameter is w equals log n, if n is on n variables. So somehow there's a big qualitative difference between this gives polynomial and w to the w gives quasi-polynomial. Okay, and more, you know, ambitiously, probably the right thing to conjecture here is if this is an epsilon, then this should be 1 over epsilon to order of w. Okay, but we'd be quite satisfied with basically any dependence on epsilon. Okay, so this uh, slightly leads me to um, conjecture I like in circuit complexity. I don't know who made this conjecture first. Um, I guess definitely people thought about it, I guess, sometime in the 90s. So it's pretty old. I haven't really seen it any written anywhere very explicitly until this year, but it's definitely an old conjecture. I'll say from the 90s. Um, it's very simple. It says that inner product mod 2 function, which I hope you remember, is not an AC0. Well, that fact is known. It's not an AC0 uh, with parity gates at the bottom. Okay, so let me explain this notation. This is the class AC0 that we know, you know, has ors and ands. And it can have negations if you want. These are unbounded fanon. It should have constant depth. And it should also have polynomial size. So that would be AC0. Uh, but in AC0 with parity gates at the bottom, you have parity gates at the bottom. Okay, so the last layer closest to the input can be parity gates. Okay, and inner product mod 2 is, well, it's inner product mod 2. It's, so it takes two n inputs. over f2 to the n, and it outputs uh, this inner product. Okay, so this is a function. I've written it so it maps f2 to the n into f2. Okay, and as you probably remember from your homework, or you may remember, this has the property that its Fourier uh, spectrum is kind of maximally spread out. Okay, so it's on 2 to the, uh, so it's on 2 n inputs, and all of the Fourier coefficients are 2 to the minus n in magnitude. It's called a bent function because all its Fourier coefficients, I don't know why they call it bent, but they're as small as they can be. Uh, and so the idea behind this conjecture is, if you remember, we proved this theorem of LMN, which said that if you have an AC0 circuit, it has pretty good Fourier spectral concentration. For example, it has all but 1 over poly n fraction of its Fourier mass up to degree poly log n. And in particular, that means on, at most, something like quasi-polynomially many Fourier characters out of the 2 to the n. So everything computed by an AC0 circuit kind of has a very sparse Fourier transform. And you kind of feel that, like, this is really just sticking these parities at the bottom just has the property of somehow replacing variables with monomials. So somehow it feels like that cannot, like, increase the sparsity uh, of the Fourier spectrum very much. So it really seems like you could not possibly get to the situation where, like, you have sort of maximal Fourier sparsity. But we don't know how to prove it. So actually, when you phrase it this way, it doesn't obviously necessarily have anything to do with Fourier analysis. Um, in fact, this is known... Uh, there's a known fact that's quite easy, also maybe from the 90s, that, okay, if you just want to show that it's not, let's say, a depth 2 circuit, let's say a DNF or a CNF with parity gates at the bottom of polynomial size, that's known. And one proof of this does not even use Fourier analysis. So, as I said, it's not necessarily a problem about Fourier analysis, but here's a highly related conjecture uh, is about Fourier analysis. 
And uh, it kind of captures this intuition that you get out of the element theorem. So this conjecture says that if f, let's say it is computed by a polysized DNF with parities next to the variables, then let's say its Fourier spectrum is quite concentrated. So then uh, its spectrum is 1 over poly n concentrated on quasi-polynomially many coefficients. So well, and to the poly log n. Okay, so if this were, this is one way, this, if this were true, it definitely implies this fact. Um, but you may even hope that this thing is true even with AC0 uh, with parity gates here based on the LMN theorem. Uh, but we don't even know it for DNFs. So we proved the LMN theorem and the concentration of AC0 circuits using the switching lemma. And somehow the switching lemma like breaks down if there are also parity gates at the bottom. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, this paper that just came out like a month ago by Rocco Servidio and, and Manuela Viola connected it to the rigid matrix rigidity problem. I don't fully grasp the connection because I didn't read that paper super carefully yet. Um, other than that, I think it's just a circuit lower bound, yeah. I'm trying to expand uh, the frontier of, of circuit complexity classes where we have a, a lower bound. It's actually... Mm. Okay, so in that sense, it's like not the greatest circuit complexity problem in the world because we know an explicit function that's not in this class. Let's say the mod 3 function. Rasbrov's Molesky shows it's not in this class, even if you're allowed to put parity gates wherever you want. But it's still some kind of circuit complexity problem. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's take a break from circuit complexity. And uh, our core Fourier analysis, like this entropy influence conjecture. And let's talk about some simple looking conjectures, again, just about combinatorics of Boolean functions. Hey, John. Hi, what's up? How much? We're talking about open problems. Would you like some cake? Oh my goodness, yes. Great. Um, yeah, you should share it with David, though. Um, you could no. take this back to the corner. David gets nothing. Okay. No, wait, David, no, I meant Patrick. David already got one. Um, what? <laughs> oh, okay, if you want. Great. Oh, so nobody's going to eat this cake now. Well, we'll save it. Have you not got one Okay, yeah. If anybody solves one of these problems by the end of the class, you can have this cake. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll eat it. This is lemon. It was supposed to be the best one, actually. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, here's a very simple definition about Boolean functions. So if f is a Boolean function, find the sensitivity of f out of string x as just the number of neighbors y of x such that uh, f has a different value on y than it does at x. Okay? Um, and so uh, we know about this, this quantity, the total influence of f, which is also called the average sensitivity, because, as you know, it's just equal to the average overall x of this thing, the sensitivity of f at x. Um, there's another well-known kind of complexity measure called the max sensitivity of f, and you can guess what it is. It's just the maximum of this value. Okay, so given a Boolean function, you look over all points and find the maximum uh, of like the number of neighbors that are different. 
course, the average sensitivity is at most the max sensitivity. So actually, as soon as you make these definitions, which are ancient definitions, you can state a nice conjecture due to uh, Servideo and Tan. From 2010, uh, it just says that the average sensitivity is actually a lot smaller than the max sensitivity if f is monotone. Okay, this is also you know it's a great conjecture because it's like four words long. Um, you know, more concretely, you can, let's say, try to prove that the average sensitivity is big O of max sensitivity to the 0.99 or something. I think they would even be happy, they had some learning theory motivation, they'd even be happy if it was like at most sensitivity over log sensitivity. And uh, the best gap, um, the best known gap from some paper of mine with Rocco, uh, there exists a monotone F with uh, uh, the average sensitivity is like at least the sensitivity, the max sensitivity to the 0.61. Okay, it's a family of Fs of increasing input length. Okay, so one may indeed hope that this is even polynomially smaller than the max sensitivity. Uh, yeah, this one's very simple. It's very hard to think of functions which have a small maximum sensitivity. Like, they just don't naturally occur. Uh, because if you take a function and like you change it at one point, you know, that basically doesn't change its average sensitivity at all, but it can make the max sensitivity jump from like some small value up to n. So this extremely sensitive complexity measure. Actually, I'll give you like another dramatic uh, aspect of the max sensitivity in a second. Any questions about this, by the way? Is it like an easy to say function that gets close to your? Uh, yeah, uh, recursive majority of three gets some other number here. Uh, this function is also like, maybe it's recursive NAND or something like that. But recursive majority of three gets something similar. Okay, um, so there's one most famous conjecture about max sensitivity of Boolean functions, and it's called the block sensitivity versus sensitivity problem. Uh, I'm going to state it in a slightly different way than it's normally stated, but it's equivalent. Do you have a question, John? Okay. We're talking about my favorite problem. Oh yeah, you missed it. It's great. I love that problem. I stated it up first. Can you restate it? No, I can't. <laughs> I forget it. Uh, yeah, this problem is, uh, I'm not sure who it's exactly attributed to, but I'm going to state it in a slightly different way. And it might have been stated in this different way even earlier by uh, Chung, Ferretti, Graham, and Seymour in like 88. It's also in like Mario Segedi's PhD thesis in 89. Maybe it's also in Gottsman Lineal from 92. It kind of has various sources. Uh, yeah, actually I'm gonna just state this in like three words. Uh, if you have a Boolean function, its degree is at most polynomial in its max sensitivity. Um, so it's easy to show that the sensitivity is always at most of the degree. So this is, says that they're polynomially related. Yeah, that's it. So if you know the block sensitivity versus sensitivity conjecture, it says that the block sensitivity of F is at most polynomial in the max sensitivity. But it's known that the block sensitivity is polynomially related to the degree. So these are equivalent problems. Okay, so in particular, it says the only way for uh, Sensitivity to be really small, as I told you, it's like a very hard to achieve condition. Small max sensitivity is for the degree to be small. Uh, the best gap here is quadratic. Uh, 
That appears in, I think, this paper. So there is a function whose degree is like the square of its max sensitivity. Uh, and the best thing that is definitely known is that the degree is at most uh, exponential in the max sensitivity. Yes, yeah, so actually, this also reminds me of, uh, here's a weaker version of this problem. One thing that I think we did on the homework, although I'm not sure, is this. Uh, suppose f is a Boolean function, let me write with zeros and ones, uh, with an odd number of ones. Okay, just meaning it takes the value one on an odd number of points in the hypercube. I think in the homework we showed that the f2 degree of this function is n, and so therefore, anyway, if we didn't, it's a known fact that this implies that the degree of the Fourier expansion is n, maximal. Uh, so that means that the sensitivity, if this were true, would have to be at least polynomially large. So a consequence of this conjecture is that this implies, let's say, the sensitivity of f, let's say if you believe the square root thing is at most, is at least n to the 1 half. Okay, or maybe weaker, at least n to the 0 0.001. And this is also open. And this is something like you can really, you know, I don't know, tell your friends in high school or elementary school, like, you just take a, a a Boolean function, you, okay, you color the Kuiper cube with red and blue, and you have to use an odd number of reds and an odd number of blues, show that there exists some point whose color differs from at least the square root n of its neighbors. Or n to the point 0. Wait, so that one is not true? It's not known. Oh. It's a consequence of this conjecture, and it's, even this consequence is not known. So it looks ridiculous, because, I mean, all you're assuming about is that it has like an odd number of ones. And your first thing is like, oh, it has an odd number of ones. Like, what is that even? I, you know, I changed the function at one point. Now it has an even number of ones. Yeah, well, if you change the function at one point, like, the sensitivity can rock it up. So there you have it. Yeah, this is probably the most, like, I don't know, disgustingly open problem I'll mention today. Where did purple go? There it is. OK, any more questions about that? OK, I'll tell you one more conjecture that's also like, can be stated in one sentence, which I love very much. Uh, here's a super simple fact about Boolean functions. Let's say you have a Boolean function, you know, range minus 1, 1. Let's look at the sum of the degree one Fourier coefficients. That's a quantity we encountered a few times in this class. We know that the degree one Fourier coefficient is a lower bound on the influence of the ith coordinate. It's the same if it's monotone, but in general it's a lower bound. So this is definitely at most the total influence of f. And remember the Fourier formula for total influence is like sum of f hat s squared times cardinality of s. So again, if you think of the Fourier coefficient squared as like uh, weights or probability distribution, then this kind of measures the average degree of f, its multilinear expansion. So of course, this is at most the degree of f. OK, so here's the conjecture due to Servideo, oh, sorry, Gopalan and Servideo, maybe 2009. Mm. Some of the degree one Fourier coefficients is at most square root degree. Okay, basically we know nothing about this problem. Uh, I'm sure they would be happy as a start, again, to just show that like, show that it's at most degree to the 0.99. We don't know that. And uh, I think they also feel that they, the worst case, you know, you want a function that somehow has low degree and um, 
as large sum of first degree coordinates as you can. Well, we know a theorem that, like, if you have no conditions, the function which maximizes the sum of the degree one Fourier coefficients is majority on all n variables. And so now if I'm like, well, it has to have degree k, the most trivial thing you could do is say, well, I'll let it be majority on k variables. That's the best they know. So uh, maybe the worst case is majority of k variables. Uh, let's say for degree k. And that's actually where the square root comes from. If it's a majority on k variables, then this thing is actually, you know, n minus 1 choose half of n minus 1 to 2 to the minus k. Or k. So, I mean, it's like something like root 2 over pi times root of the degree. So you may even try to conjecture that if you're really bold. But basically, we know nothing. So just prove anything. It's a good start. This also has some learning theoretic motivations. Uh, OK, any questions about these guys? So this is just all for Boolean values. Yeah, yeah, this is all for Boolean valued f. Um, OK, let me tell you one more uh, nice question about Boolean valued f. And this is about characterizing what does it mean if a function has low Fourier sparsity. This is about functions both with low uh, degree. We talked about low sensitivity. Another interesting question is uh, low Fourier sparsity. So to make this conjecture, I'll make one more definition. It's quite a simple one. Again, for a Boolean valued f, let's uh, Let's say it's parity decision tree complexity, denoted like that, is the least depth of a parity decision tree, which I'll define in a second. You can probably guess the definition. That computes f. OK, and what is a parity decision tree? Well, it's like a decision tree, and a decision tree you know, it's like a tree that like queries coordinates of an unknown string x. Uh, and here you just can query any parity that you want at a node. So instead of querying xi, you can query, uh, I don't know, the parity of some subset of coordinates s. OK, and that's either, I don't know, 0 or 1. And then you can query some other parity of the bits here. You can query some other parity of the bits here if you want. OK, and then eventually at the leaves, you have to output the value of the function. OK, so this is a stronger complexity measure than decision tree because you can always query parities of size 1 if you want. Uh, and it's you know, potentially much stronger because if you take the parity of all the bits, that requires a decision tree of depth n, but it requires a parity decision tree of depth 1. So it's much stronger. Uh, the conjecture I'm going to mention didn't invent this concept. Actually, this is a, quite an old concept because uh, it's easy to show that a parity decision tree of depth k has Fourier L1 at most exponential in k. And so if k is like log n, you can learn these things in uh, polynomial time. This is an observation made by Kushlevitz and Mansur in the paper that gave the Kushlevitz Mansur learning algorithm. So it's an interesting class of functions which have. Um, some kind of spectral simplicity. If the depth is k, the sum of the absolute values of the Fourier coefficients is at most, I don't know, 2 to the k or 4 to the k or something. Um, OK, so the conjecture I'll mention is due to Montanaro and Osborne. I think this is the earliest. They made it in uh, 2010. And here's the conjecture. Uh, let's say f is a Boolean function with uh, s greater than 1 non-zero Fourier coefficients. OK, so think of s as small. So it's a function that happens to have very few non-zero Fourier coefficients, sparsity s. Then the conjecture is that it has a very shallow parity decision tree. So 
So they conjectured at most poly log s. It kind of makes sense. I mean, somehow if it only has a small number of Fourier coefficients, it kind of like only depends on few parities. So certainly you could query all of those parities and get like a depth s decision tree. But somehow they feel that if you only depend on few parities, they must have some kind of additive or arithmetic structure among them, which causes a lot of collapse when you start querying the parities and that you can get this decision tree depth down to poly log s. Any questions about that? Actually, um, me and Eric Blay and uh, Leung Tan were thinking about this. And uh, you might even conjecture uh, that this could be replaced by floor of log 2 base s, okay, which would be exactly sharp. Okay, maybe, maybe you should put ceiling or something. I didn't exactly check the plus ones. Um, but for example, if you're the AND function on log s coordinates, your Fourier day sparsity will be s. And it's not hard to check that you need to make log s queries, even with parity queries. But this is like a fun conjecture also to think about, because really it's like up to like, you know, there's no polylog, there's no factors. It's like up to plus one. So you, like, you can try it on like functions with like, sparsity 10 or something and try to make it fail. Uh, and if this were really true, then it kind of looks like maybe you should be able to prove it by induction or something. Like, this is a very strong statement. Uh, but we don't know. This also has some motivation from quantum communication complexity. Yeah? Can I ask you about the last one? Yes, um, you may. Is it known if you like true or false for like uh, Let me think about it. Um, uh, let's see, my first instinct is to try to disprove it by choosing a degree one function. Uh, but probably you thought about that and you're saying, like, if it has to be bounded into minus one, one. It, the sum has to be about one. Yeah. So your degree is one, so you're good. Yeah, you're right. I don't know. Yeah, you think it's a, like actually a definite consequence? I agree that like it should be, uh, my first thing is to say that yeah, it should also be, if it's true, it should also be true for bounded functions. Um, Yeah, yeah. We should think about like whether if you write f, if you write a function with this as like the average of a bunch of boolean valued functions, maybe you can deduce it. But maybe maybe not actually. Mm -hmm. Because uh, take f and minus f. Then yeah. Oh, that has like small degree or something. Yeah. Wait, the function f and minus f? Or no, I think he means like if you imagine average to f and minus f. Yeah. It's not obvious, but it feels like it should. Well, oh, actually, you know what? I think you should use some norm conditions or something. I'll ask Rocco. No, so, like Sir Video, in other words, I. He is like. I mean, they've thought about this a lot. Um, my instinct is that it's true, but maybe they have a counterexample. It feels like you know. I mean. All facts are true. I'll write the next one. Go ahead. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. Can you add the conjecture for real brain? Maybe add it right to the... And then, yeah, if you can solve it, or if you can refute it by the end of class, then you can get the lemon cake. 
this the right conjecture? Uh, yeah, but they have some, they thought of a lot of crazy functions. They have some pumpkin, uh, ha function they call pumpkin head function, which uh, it's like a counterexample to like the most natural way to try to prove this. Okay, this, this, uh, this one I like very much. It's kind of just for jokes somehow. Uh, it's a conjecture made by Thomas Sevsky in 89. Uh, here it is. Let's say that a1 squared plus dot 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 plus a n squared is 1. So these are a bunch of real numbers. Uh, I'm going to start talking about linear threshold function related conjectures now. Uh, then it's, his conjecture is some kind of anti-concentration statement, but it's very simple to say. You could also tell it to. Wait, do you get like x1 plus x2 plus x1 x2 for proving that? Oh, that's a Boolean function. Never mind. No, that's not a Boolean. It's hard to say because, I mean, no. you should also, you know, let's put this oh, here for safety in which case. Don't do that. I'll go for the. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll take this out. Okay, so if you have x1 plus x2 plus x1 x2. Yes. Um, or minus x1, x2. Okay. Then, then it's a boolean, right? No, because sometimes it, when x1 is, is not e or equals x2, then it's 0. But when x1 is not equal to x2, then it's hmm. 1 or minus 1. No, but you said x1 no, I don't know. <laughs> x1 plus x2 minus x1, x2. Okay, I expect a full report at the end of this. So. <laughs> Maybe n should be odd. No, I don't know. Um, okay, fine. Put big O in for safety. Uh, okay, here's Tom Sevsky's uh, conjecture. You pick x at random from plus or minus 1 to the n, and you look at a1, x1 plus dot 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 a n, x n, and you ask, is that uh, at most 1? Okay, and his conjecture is that that happens with probability, wait, uh, no, I guess this is a concentration conjecture. That happens with probability uh, at least a half. That's it. Uh, if true, this would be sharp by the example of a1 equals a2 equals 1 over root 2, which is uh, half the time x1 equals x2, in which case this sum is 0. That's it. And uh, the best thing that's known about this is due to Holman and Kleitman from 92. They show that actually even the probability that this thing is strictly less than 1 is pretty big. They show that strictly less than 1 is at least 3 eighths. Unless the trivial case happens, unless one of the AIs is plus or minus 1. Okay, if one of the AIs is plus or minus 1, then it's just uh, it's always 1. But otherwise, they show that it's at least 3 eighths. Uh, if one of the AIs is 1, this happens with probability 1. And funnily enough, this one is completely sharp. So you can check that this is completely sharp uh, by A1, A2, A3, A4, or all a half. So, I don't know, that's why this one's kind of for jokes, like, there's not somehow a big difference there. But. Is it like a simple proof? No, it's a pain. Maybe there should be a simple proof, but like, it's really like, if you studied this like LTS, you know, before, there's like some critical index stuff, and like, this all predated that, but it uses that. Like, you kind of say, well... Either the weights are decaying really rapidly. So the idea behind all of this is that if all the weights are small, then this kind of acts like a Gaussian. And the probability that a Gaussian in absolute value is at most 1 is like, I don't know, some explicit number which happens to be bigger than a half. And if all the weights are not small, then like, you know, maybe they're really big. Like one of them is 1, in which case you're fine. Or like, they're like 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, in which case you're fine. So like, it somehow seems no matter what the case is, you should be fine. It's hard to like make that into a proof. So Holman Kleitman kind of does something like all that reasoning, and they manage to get this exactly sharp result, but not this one. So there you have it. Okay.
so while we're on the topic of LTS, I'll tell you another conjecture that I guess I already told you before, uh, but I'll repeat it. Wait, does that like imply anything, or is it like a standalone? No. Richard Guy cared. He's the one that wrote about this. This actually appeared in, not under his name, but uh, in American Math Monthly due to Richard Guy. So, uh, no, somebody did care because I mean, I care, but somebody, I don't have the reference, but some paper from 90s didn't even know about any of this. And they had some like actual application besides just for fun, which sadly I now forget. And they proved this with one third, which is worse. but. They had a reason for it, which I forget, but I'll try to recall. OK, this one I mentioned before, a majority is least stable. I, I kind of mention it because like the kicker with the 2 over pi is very similar somehow to this Tomasevsky thing. Uh, this is due to Benjamin E. Kalai and Schramm in 99. And it just says, let f be an LTF. linear threshold function or weighted majority. OK, and assume n is odd because we're going to make the following conjecture for all rho, let's say a constant. Well, actually, it doesn't even have to be a constant. Let it depend on n if you want. Uh, the noise stability at rho of f is at least that of majority. So in other words, within the class of uh, LTFs, the LTF with all equal weights is the least noise stable. Which it kind of has to be. Like, what could it possibly be otherwise? I mean, it's either a dictator, which is actually the most noise stable, or what could it be besides majority? But we cannot prove it. Um, one implication of this, if you take rho going or close to zero, close to one, is that the noise sensitivity at delta of f is at most that of what it is for majority, which you can compute is like 2 over pi plus little of 1 with respect to delta times root delta. And remember, we proved this Perez theorem way back when. He proved this thing uh, with the constant root 2 over pi, okay, which is a little bit bigger. So he got close up to a constant, but he did not prove it. And if you take uh, rho all the way to um, zero, this is another uh, implication of the conjecture. You say if f is an LTF and it also has mean zero, this implies that the weight at level one is at least two over pi. And this conjecture that LTFs with mean zero have weight at degree one, at least two over pi, has like some very mildly positive learning theory consequence. Um, the best thing that's known, I think we even did this in class. Oh, well, the best thing that was known for a long time was that this is at least a half. You can prove that lower bound of a half using Gottsman, well, Gottsman lineal proved it. You prove it using Kinchin inequality. And uh, this year it got up to a half plus epsilon zero for some unspecified pos positive constant epsilon zero. So it's, in my opinion, extremely likely that the correct answer is two over pi. I guess this disproves that the correct answer is a half, although we didn't really believe that anyway. Uh, but it's something. That's due to De, Dyke, and Nicholas, and Servideo. OK, any questions? I got uh, two more. OK, so this uh, second to last one. Oh, my function was wrong. That was still open. Oh, great. Why was it wrong? That's pretty good. But then the sum of the four equations. Yeah. I mean, how do you get a minus three? I mean, it's minus one. Oh, it's minus one. Yeah. 
It's like the most in-class discussion we've had like all year. Like, I should have posed this at the beginning and told you to compute the Fourier expansion of the following function of two bits. It's <laughs> great. So it's, it's, uh, it didn't work out, huh? Yeah, so okay, I don't I, think I deserve that, though. All right, take out the big O, then. Because you, uh, I didn't prove it. Oh, good. <laughs> you can't disprove your own conjecture, though. No, I just proved the disproof. No, you can't. Oh, I see. Then it's fine. You can have the rest of that if you want. It's pretty good. Uh, okay, here's a conjecture that I made with uh, Adam Clivens and Rocco Servidio in 02. That's uh, related to this stuff. So we were also uh, working on some learning problems. And this is a conjecture that says a certain class of functions has small noise sensitivity. So it says if f is the and of k LTFs, f is a Boolean function, then its noise sensitivity at delta is at most uh, root log k times root delta. OK, this would be uh, nice for learning. You know, we know with that if you have a class of functions, all of whose noise sensitivity is small, you get a learning algorithm. And the naive bound for this, which is also the best known, well, I say naive, assuming Perez's theorem, is just the thing you get out of the union bound. I think this was even on the homework. It's just k times root delta. <coughs> um, so this would give like even a better than exponential Improvement, uh, I think we proved this in like some very weak cases, like if all of the KLTFs depend on disjoint sets of variables. Um, yeah, I should also say that why did we make this specific you know, number, root log k? Well, one is uh, it seems to be the correct number if you look at the and of k, not majorities, but symmetric threshold functions all of whose mean are like 1 minus 1 over k. So that'll be roughly balanced. And if you do the calculation, its noise sensitivity is that. In fact, there's a, a special case of this conjecture is that it takes a little work to see it's a special case. But from this philosophy that if you ever have like bits, you can use them to simulate Gaussian random variables just by adding up a whole bunch of them. Anytime you have some conjecture about Boolean LTS, you tend to have a similar conjecture about um, half spaces, signs of linear forms in Gaussian space. So actually, a truly a special case of this is the theorem that if A, let me call it, well, OK, A in Rn is a convex set with at most k faces, OK, in other words, it's like the intersection of k signs of uh, linear forms or linear threshold functions, then it's Gaussian surface area, which is some kind of analog of noise sensitivity, is at most root log k. OK, and this special case is actually a theorem by Nazarov. OK, so this is a funny situation. Well, actually, it's a Sort of a common situation, actually, where you have a problem about Boolean functions, especially about LTS. It has some like problem in Gaussian geometry as a special case. And like the Gaussian problem is actually significantly easier. I don't know, somehow everything is more symmetric. You can use some geometry. I guess I can add that this theorem is sort of almost known with poly log k and some poly and delta. If the special case, if all of the half spaces or the LTFs are sufficiently regular, it just kind of means they have small influences. That's the theorem of uh, Harsha, Clivens, and Mecca. This kind of theorem also maybe has some connection to like uh, circuit lower bounds, because it's kind of connected to the class TC0, which is like constant depth circuits with threshold gates. Um, any questions about that one? No? Does that prove like a, is there, there's like a similar one for like the product, the uh, degree K PTS? Oh, yeah, so there's, OK, there's one conjecture that I like very much. Uh, 
that was solved during this class, during this semester. More or less solved. It's Gottsman lineal conjecture. I'm not sure if I mentioned it. It dates back to like 94 or something. And it says that if you have a degree, okay, there's no and or anything. If you just have a, a degree D PTF, that's a sign of a degree D polynomial, the conjecture that it's noise sensitivity at delta is like um, O of D times root delta. So that's true if D is 1 by Perez's theorem. And more weakly, you can just conjecture that if D is constant, so it's a sign of a constant degree polynomial, then the noise sensitivity is also O of root delta. And that was open for an extremely long time. And then Daniel Kane in 2009-ish or 2010-ish proved the Gaussian analog, which is that if you have a, a set in space, which is the sign of a degree D polynomial, then its Gaussian surface area is at most O of D. And then Daniel Kane this semester, using some invariance principle stuff, proved the Gaussman lineal conjecture, uh, let's say for constant D. So he proved that the noise sensitivity is at most exponential in D. You'd rather have con uh, constant times D, but exponential in D times delta to the half, and maybe there's some polylogs in there. So he came pretty close. It's pretty awesome. So uh, if we'd done this class last year, that would have been my, one of my top conjectures to state, but now it's mostly proved. But, uh, yeah. Is the proof of this thing similar to like this thing? Uh, no. Not really. This uses some, I don't know, reasoning about convex geometry. I mean, it takes some amount of work, whereas the Daniel Kane thing, it's almost like two lines long if you write it in the right way. Um, it's very nice. Okay, uh, all right, so last conjecture. This is an oldie. I like this one very much. It's due to the mighty Michel Talegrand. 89. And uh, he called it convolution with the bias coin conjecture. I won't bother writing that. Uh, let me, to get warm up to it, let me just make some obvious remarks. So suppose that F, is a function on the Boolean cube, which is non-negative, and its mean is 1. So what I would ask you, let you know, t be a big number. Let's say t is at least 1, but think of it as big. I would ask you, can you bound for me probability that f of x is at least t? That's at most something. What could I put there? One over t. Yeah, 1 over t by Markov inequality. That's quite trivial, and that's sharp because, you know, if this is the hypercube down here, you know, the function can be like, it can be like equal to t on some subset of the hypercube of uh, fractional size 1 over t and 0 elsewhere. So uh, there's nothing you can do. That's true. Um, this is a very spiky function, though, and Telegram said, like, what if you smoothed out f a little bit? Okay, so Telegram said uh, fix some constant, any constant rho less than 1. So think of it as 0.999, or think of it as a half. It really doesn't matter. And he said, now what can you say about probability over x that t rho f of x is at least t, little t? So t rho of x is still non-negative. It's like a convolution of a non-negative function. And its mean is still 1, right? This is like an averaging operator. At any point, you sort of average s values on a neighborhood, so the mean is still 1. So you can still use Markov and say it's at most 1 over t. But like, it seems that's like a smoother function. Like, for example, if this were the f, but then you applied t rho, then like it would kind of, I don't know, look more smooth or something. And his conjecture is that you can improve on Markov's inequality here. So. Actually, he just wants you to show that it's at least little o of 1 over t. More strongly, you should probably show that it's o of uh, 1 over t log t. Okay, this would be sharp. You can uh, consider some example that looks like a step function like this, and this is the bound you get. So you save like a log factor. Um, all right, so it's very, I don't know, to me, it's a very appealing geometric conjecture. Just says, you know, 
Markov's inequality cannot be sharp for functions that you slightly smooth out. Also seems pretty hard, so um, this also, the conjecture implies a Gaussian special case. Just like over here. And the Gaussian special case is very similar. It's just the same thing about functions on Rn. And it says the exact same statement. Um, we have to interpret T rho in the Gaussian sense. It's like this ornstein uhlenbeck thing, uh, more precisely, actually. In the Gaussian world, T rho of f at x is the expected value of f at rho times x plus root 1 minus rho times z, where z is an independent Gaussian. Okay, so it's also kind of, you take x, you scale it a little bit, and you average over that neighborhood. So if Gaussian, uh, sorry, if Talgrand's conjecture was true about Boolean functions, it would imply it for Gaussian functions. Uh, so you might try this setting first. This is still open, though. Uh, so you might try that first. If you're really uh, non-ambitious, well, if you want to start somewhere, you could try the Gaussian case with n equals 1. And this is known. So uh, James Lee and I also worked it out, and it also appears in a paper by uh, Ball, Barthes, um, Bednarz, Oleskovich, and Wolf. OK, so uh, this special case is known, so you can try to get started by using it. Uh, but I think Catalogram would even be super happy if you proved it in the Gaussian case. And he'd be super duper happy if you proved uh, his whole conjecture. Uh, he'll even give you $1,000 if you prove this. So Boolean functions can be lucrative as well if you're good at them. OK, any questions about this conjecture? Uh, I don't think it can be that easy. But, well, uh, certainly we have the hypercontractive inequality for bits, also in Gaussian space. But it doesn't seem like you can immediately use it to get this. In Talegrand's paper, he somehow comments that this conjecture, he comments that it's like a hypercontractive inequality for the L1 norm. I don't actually exactly know what he meant by that. but. Um, I don't know, some kind of like quantification of how much T rho smooths things out. I guess it's the L1 norm because maybe you could have dropped this and put absolute values everywhere. But. Okay, there's two minutes left. There's time for any more questions. Yeah, yeah, I should actually say if it's for the n equals one case, it's, they get this. And actually, for any constant n bigger than 1, they get this with like a log log t on top. So from constant n, it works. I don't know the exact dependence on n. Yeah. Great. My, that's the best kind of question, right. I guess. Yeah, uh, the question about F2 Fourier degree, or F2 degree, degree is representation of the field, which is known to always be smaller than the real degree, yeah? At least there. Yeah, so a lot of statements that uh, get around on this, on the, um, Fourier degree are also make sense with uh, F2 degree. Yeah. And it's not that It's possible, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. They're equally valid things to think about. I mean, this f2 degree is important. I mean, a lot of, the, on the other hand, a lot of the conjectures I mentioned today that had the real degree in there will be false with the f2 degree. Because you have this sort of strange phenomenon that, like, parity function has to f2 degree 1. But some of them could still be true. Um, and it's important, yeah. I mean, like, for example, if a function is small f2 degree, then you can also learn it in time, like, n to the degree. Which is Yeah, um, I know less about it, but um, 
I don't think less is known about it. I just know less about it. I mean, it's it's well studied, I think. I guess that could be a way to prove the IPTOs not in JP0 with the drug strategy from the Uh, yep. Yeah, IPT, IP2 is an agree to S2 yeah, and AC, I mean, also AC0, the structure of that over finite fields is understood, yeah. like, sort of uh, at least as well, maybe, as it's understood for real, in the real setting. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's a conjecture, but... Yeah. Yeah, you could try to think about it from that angle. Because there's, like, round drops in one. Yeah. Well, it's it's like yeah, if like you have a AC zero function, there's a, a low degree, even under any distribution, there's a low degree polynomial, a polylog degree polynomial over F two that um, computes it approximately. Okay, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>